Welcome back to CarnDeities.org. Today we are going to be continuing with our series, The Skeptic and the Shrink. This is the psychologist's case for skepticism. In this video, we're going to be looking at confirmation bias, justification, and reliability. So, imagine that you believe that there is a poltergeist in your house. You look for signs of the poltergeist, like your furniture having been moved around. For those of you who don't know, poltergeist is a type of ghost. You interpret noises that you hear as if they were the poltergeist moving your things around. When thinking back, you remember all of the times you've come home and thought that your chairs were in a different place than you left them, and forgot all of the other times when your furniture was exactly where you left it. You Therefore conclude that you are justified in believing that there is a poltergeist in your house. Now, the problem is that your justification has fallen prey to three different kinds of what is known as confirmation bias. Confirmation bias occurs when you construe evidence, either by looking for, interpreting, or remembering, to conform to what you already believe. In the example, because you already believed that there was a poltergeist in your house, you looked for evidence that this was true, interpreted the evidence you had as supporting your belief, and only remembered cases that supported your belief, not ones that discredited it. The point here is that confirmation bias can cause you to think that your beliefs are more justified or more reliable than they actually are. In this video, we will discuss three kinds of confirmation bias. Investigation bias, analysis bias, and memory bias. These come under other names. Possibly investigation bias might also be called um, search bias. Analysis bias might be called interpretation bias. There's a number of different names for them. We're going to use investigation, analysis, and memory. Then we will see how these kinds of biases might make you overestimate your own justification when confronting skeptical scenarios and other epistemic puzzles, especially those facing scientific realists. Clearly, as with our poltergeist example, for those that believe in supernatural phenomena, either spirits or various types of religious miracles or acts, confirmation bias is going to be a clear problem, but there's a lot of information out there on the way that confirmation bias can affect those beliefs. So what we're going to be talking about here and more focusing on is how confirmation bias can affect your scientific beliefs and your general claims that beliefs about science, especially scientific realist beliefs, are justified. If you don't know what scientific realism is, check out my video on the subject. We are not going to focus on the studies that have been done and that have provided evidence for these biases, but rather on the implications of them. This is not a channel where we're digging into kind of the psychology of things, where we're going to be digging into evaluating the particular experiments. I don't have the background to give you the best possible kind of diagnosis of these particular studies, what they should have done better, whether or not they are 100% accurate from a psychologist's point of view. What I am here to do is talk about saying that if you do understand these studies and think as a scientific realist might that they are true or say true things about the world, why this might in turn undermine some of your other beliefs about science or your other scientific hypotheses. Okay? So, when investigating if there was a poltergeist in your house, you looked for evidence of the poltergeist. You did not look for evidence against it. This is a type of confirmation bias known as investigation bias. It occurs when you only look for something that would confirm your belief, not something that would falsify it. Investigation bias is particularly problematic now that search engines can give you whatever answer to a question that you want. Unfortunately, while the internet has a huge wealth of information, it also has information on both sides of issues that may not actually have both sides. Someone that believes, for example, that vaccines cause autism is more likely to type 
in a positive statement like proof that vaccines cause autism, perhaps then a neutral question, do vaccines cause autism, and definitely then a negative question, proof that vaccines do not cause autism. Since they're more likely to search for evidence that will confirm their beliefs rather than evidence that will falsify them, they will come to believe that a particular belief is more justified than it actually is. Because our search engines and the way that we look for things is driven towards providing you what you want, it's going to provide you with the answers that you want, even if those answers are less justified than an answer you don't want. Studies have shown that when given the choice between a question which could falsify someone's beliefs and one which could confirm those beliefs, people will choose the question that confirms them. Combining this with the tendency of search engines means that while the internet may provide people with a wider range of opinions, they will be directed to those similar to their own. And in combination with other functions of the internet, like directing you towards advertisements and websites based on your preferences, and allowing you to block people on social media that you disagree with, it seems no wonder that people around the world are more partisan than ever, since they only hear opinions from those that agree with them. And then, because of confirmation bias, what they do is they believe that their opinions, which may in fact be quite radical, are more justified because they have only looked for people that agree with them. They've then found those people that agree with them because of the way that our search engines and our internet works, and therefore feel like they're in a bubble of people that all agree with those radical beliefs, and therefore think that everyone should agree with them. However, this allows those people to feel more comfortable and justified in those radical beliefs because it seems like everyone around them believes them. But the problem is they've fallen prey to confirmation bias and they've fallen prey to the way that the internet works of guiding you towards things that you already believe. The point here is that many people, through both confirmation bias and this kind of internet bias, have today become more certain of beliefs that are generally unjustified. How does this apply to skepticism? It seems that scientists are trained to purposefully try to falsify their hypotheses. And what really defines the scientific method is that it is constantly trying to prove its own theories wrong. So it would seem that the scientific method is geared towards avoiding confirmation bias. However, the problem arises when we ask about the justification for the scientific method itself. Most scientists take this method for granted and continue only looking for evidence that confirms it by continuing to do science. Instead of looking for evidence for puzzles like the problem of underdetermination or the problem of induction, which in fact argue against the scientific method and provide evidence that the scientific method does not actually provide truth. Note that this isn't a problem for everyone that uses science, but rather for our scientific realists who believe that science says something about the world, okay? Basically, whenever a scientist reaches a result which disagrees with their hypothesis, they have to throw out one of their assumptions. This could be one related to the experiment or the scientific paradigm. But generally, scientists do not throw out or question the scientific method itself. Now, for scientific instrumentalists who are simply saying that the scientific method seems useful, so I'm going to use it, this isn't too much of a problem, because if they threw out the scientific method, then they would be getting rid of that thing that seems to them to be useful. But for people that are scientific realists that say the scientific method is saying something true about the world, when they're looking for actual truths about the world, it seems that not considering that the scientific method is what's causing you to run into contradictions seems to be a huge oversight because you're just looking for information that confirms that the scientific method works, not any information that would disconfirm it. There's no idea that we could ever throw out the claim that the future will be like the past, because as soon as we throw that out, we have to stop doing science. And because science wants to be kind of self-preserving, it says, well, if we threw out that claim, we'd be out of a job. So we're never going to even consider throwing out the claim that the future will be like the past. This is the very reason that the problem of induction and the problem of underdetermination are so insoluble to the scientific realist. Watch my videos on 
the problem of induction and the problem of underdetermination a theory is just a theory here on carnades.org for more information about those huge problems for the scientific realist. Now, imagine the scientific realist is like someone with a ghost detector 3000. They use this machine to test various theories about ghosts being in particular houses or not. The person claims that the machine cannot definitively say that there is a ghost in a particular house, but it can say if there's definitely not a ghost in a particular house. In the same way that scientific theories can be falsified but never truly proven or verified to be 100% sure. This person goes around trying to falsify hypotheses about ghosts. So it may seem that they've overcome their investigation confirmation bias. However, they do not try to falsify their claim that the Ghost Detector 3000 is a justified way to detect ghosts. Similarly, the scientific realist ignores the evidence that the scientific method is insufficient to find knowledge because they already believe the opposite. Note that this type of confirmation bias will not be a reason to suspect that we might be in an empirically equivalent skeptical scenario, a la the duplication argument, since there's no way that we could even attempt to falsify or confirm either hypothesis. Yet, it is a reason to suspect that our faith in the scientific method is unjustified, or that perhaps we're in a skeptical scenario that isn't emp empirically equivalent, where there might be something different, maybe a dream or the matrix, one of those kind of weaker-seeming skeptical scenarios, is the kind of thing that we can investigate whether or not we're in that scenario. Okay? Now, the next type of confirmation bias that we will discuss is analysis bias, or interpretation bias. This bias occurs when someone analyzes information that they are presented with through the lens of what they already believe. Interpreting noises you hear in a house as a poltergeist because you already believe one is present might be an example. Another might be discrediting the methodology of a study simply because you disagree with its conclusions. Analysis bias poses a particular problem in conjunction with the problem of holistic underdetermination. Imagine that you have a particular belief. You have one study which confirms that belief and one study which falsifies that belief or disconfirms that belief, shows that belief to be false. Since you have a contradiction, you are underdetermined as to which study to doubt. You can't believe both studies and still may stay rational, but you have to doubt one, but there's no way for you to tell which study to doubt more. Studies have shown that you are in fact more likely to irrationally doubt the study that disagrees with your belief by questioning its methods, even if they're in fact the same methods as the study which confirms your belief. Now, questioning methodology is less a problem in philosophy, because unless you are an advocate of something like non-classical logic, it is very clear if an argument is valid or not. However, it is possible to question the intuitions that give rise to the premises of a particular argument, or basically question whether or not an argument is sound, whether or not the premises are true. And because philosophy does have to rely a lot on the idea of intuition, I can have an intuition one way and you can have an intuition the other way, and those intuitions to a certain degree have to remain being unjustified, and if you disagree on intuition, you just kind of have to bite the bullet. And that will be quite a problem for this idea of analysis bias. For example, one that believes that justification is foundational and comes from some basic truths and basically is a foundationalist about justification might have a bias towards claiming that the intuition that justification comes from coherence between a web of beliefs is unacceptable and therefore find the coherentist arguments unjustified for a biased reason, while the coherentist who has the opposite belief might do the same. Basically, because someone is already a foundationalist, they're going to hold on to that belief and say, well, I'm a foundationalist, so your intuition that coherence is the idea behind justification is just wrong. It's against my intuition. And the coherentist is going to say the opposite, so they're going to just end up butting heads and not having an actual interesting argument because they're biasedly ignoring their opponent's intuitions because they already have an intuition which confirms a particular belief. Okay? Now, the interesting consequence of this bias is that it should not affect a true Peronian skeptic. The Peronian skeptics have no beliefs. Therefore, they cannot analyze a particular experiment, 
argument or intuition with some bias towards their beliefs, since they don't have any beliefs to begin with. This is not to say that some people that attempt to follow the path of skepticism do not retain some beliefs and therefore biases, but if you do not have any beliefs, then in principle you cannot have some amount of bias towards those beliefs. You could have bias towards desires or wants or other kinds of propositional attitudes, or simply have a propensity for being biased towards a certain type of experiment over another or a certain kind of position over another. However, this particular idea of bias based on beliefs is not going to apply to the skeptic. The Peronian skeptic, at least, walks into every argument with no beliefs or biases. Yet anyone else who even harbors the sole belief that knowledge is impossible, like the academic skeptic, will be prone to irrationally doubting those beliefs of others which disagree with their belief. When there is equal evidence that you are in the matrix and that you are not in the matrix, you'll usually and unjustifiably revert to whatever belief you had to begin with, when in fact it seems the only rational choice is to suspend judgment. When you have equal evidence for each of two claims, it seems the rational choice is to spend judgment on which of those claims is true, not to simply pick whichever claim you rationally had a good feeling for in the first place. The final type of confirmation bias that we will look at in this video is memory confirmation bias. This occurs when someone is more likely to remember justification for a belief that they have rather than some event that disconfirms that belief. An example might be your remembering all the times you came home and found your furniture was moved around, but not all the times you came home and everything seemed the same. As with the other kinds of confirmation bias, there's a greater problem the more information you have. If you read 50 papers on the truth of the moon landing, 49 of them tell you it was real and one tells you it was faked. If you believe already that the moon landing was faked, you're more likely to remember the paper that reinforced your belief than the ones that disconfirmed your belief, even though they were greater in number. There are a wide variety of reasons to doubt your memory, and we're not going to get into all of them here. However, if you are a skeptic who has no beliefs, which cause you to remember occurrences that confirm those beliefs over ones that disconfirm them, it seems you are slightly more likely to have trustworthy memories though believing those memories to be true would defeat the whole point. But using them perhaps to navigate your life might do some good, in a kind of, once again, instrumentalist idea. Overall, confirmation bias is a process which works to irrationally appear to justify those beliefs of dogmatists by only looking at, or looking for, the evidence which confirms those beliefs. Though not a perfectly deductive argument for complete skepticism, hopefully, being aware of confirmation bias will make you more likely to doubt your own justifications and beliefs, which may have been arrived at irrationally. Everyone thinks that their beliefs are not the ones affected by these biases, that their beliefs are not ones that are only there because they're being confirmed by only looking for the right information. But, as we'll learn in a future video on optimism bias, that in fact that idea that your beliefs are kind of perfect and sacred and other people's beliefs are the ones that have problems is called optimism bias. It's an irrational bias as well. That was confirmation bias. Next up, we're going to be looking at the illusion of control, then, as I just noted, optimism bias, and then the Dunning-Kruger effect. Watch this video and more here at carnities.org and stay skeptical, everybody.